This is the Lean Construction Blogs Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories, case studies, and lessons learned of applying lean construction from around the world. Join Dick Beyer as he interviews industry leaders, lean construction practitioners, and subject matter experts to help you improve the build environment in general and your design and construction projects in particular, advance your lean journey, and bring your continuous improvement efforts to the next level. Let's get started. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the uh, leanconstructionblog.com podcast. I'm Dick Beyer, and today we are joined by, uh, for episode number 30, this is actually really, uh, really timely, um, the only luminary that we haven't spoken to in the lean world uh, that we have access to, uh, Dr. Glenn Ballard. So, Dr. Ballard, great to see you, Glenn. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am spectacular for an old guy. Thank you very well, much. I, have, I could make that amendment also. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, thanks for joining us. I mean, you are obviously one of the uh, one of the stars in a very small constellation of of stars in the uh, in the lean community, uh, and you are you know fundamentally uh, a founder, the founder. You're right there in that group of uh, pioneers. That's why we kind of invented the Pioneer Award for you and Greg early on. And uh, it's mostly lived up to its reputation, I think, over the years. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, where you were raised, where you came from, how you were educated. Mm -hmm. I heard a story that you were a rodeo cowboy in South Texas one time, and that may not be true. Well, that's almost true. <laughs> I was raised on a ranch in Southeast Texas, the extreme oh. Southeast corner. So if you went any further, another two steps, you'd be in the Gulf of Mexico. If you're going south and if you're going east, you'd be in Louisiana. So mm -hmm. or in the in that part of the world, you'd say Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be heading for Jambalaya or something like that, right? Exactly right. Yeah. Uh, most of my most of my classmates were uh, French Canadian Cajuns. So, yeah, who uh, there's a long I know a lot of Acadians up here and the story yeah. of the deportation of the Acadians is is quite a story um, yeah. for Canadians, for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So you ended yeah. up. So were you born there? Born and raised? Or? Yeah. Well, I was I was born near there, uh, a little bit up in East Texas. Uh, I was born in Liberty, Texas, which is right on the Trinity River. And apparently wow. that's. It wasn't right where my family was was living, but that was the closest hospital. <laughs> so sure. they, were out in the, they were out in the country. They were all farmers and ranchers and agricultural people. So, and um, and you decided not to not to follow in their footsteps and to to move on. I and mean, you you ended up going to St. John's in uh, Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I I had uh, gone for a year commuting from home to um, a nearby uh, 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 state Texas State University, Lamar State College of Technology, I think it was called. And uh, at the end of that, I said, you know, I can read books, and I don't think I'm getting anything more than that from being in this university. And so I decided to. Uh, immigrate to Australia and, and homestead a horse ranch. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I almost did. And but I was at the time getting had a subscription to a, a magazine called Saturday Review. And hey. they ran an article on St. John's College and this new campus in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it was the I think to my knowledge, it was the first time a university opened us a, 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 a spatially separate campus. You know, at a distance. So the first one is in Maryland, uh, Annapolis, Maryland. It's the third oldest college in the United States. So, wow. Well, I was uh, I was they, born in Laurel. Maryland, because, I, I went there because it it sounded like from that article, it sounded like the what I thought university was supposed to be, and it's a, a completely um, all required curriculum. It was formed by some gentlemen who had. Uh, been seduced by the great books program at uh, at Oxford University in the UK, and they said, "Well, <clears throat> let's make let's re replicate that at at St. John's." 
and they did it, but with one addition. Uh, that is the addition of, uh, so it has a seminar that runs through all four years where you talk, you read, and you read the originals about, you know, we started with the Iliad, for example, right? right? And then went all the way up to, I don't know, some, something much more recent. And then there was mathematics. Okay? We started with Euclid's Elements and Ptolemy's Almagest, and then worked our way up to Lobachevsky's new non-Euclidean geometries and so forth. And uh, there was a uh, language tutorial and which didn't, we weren't trying to learn the language. We were using a foreign language as a foil to really better understand language as such, right? And so wow. the foil in the first two years was uh, classical Greek and then the, the third and fourth French. Okay? And what yeah. they did was <laughs> a, a whole uh, laboratory sciences for all four years, okay? Wow. So we went from and kind of constructing a slide rule when people use slide rules <laughs> by, by <laughs> making one up and uh, all the way to Einstein. That's fantastic. I actually thought about going to St. John's. I ended up going to Middlebury just oh. so I could feel what it was like to be really cold for a very <laughs> long time. <laughs> uh, but that's a really, that's a really interesting trajectory uh, there is a guy here, his name is, I think it's Joseph, but it's Mr. Smith, who just gave $100 million to Queen's University for their engineering program to mm -hmm. try to bring humanities into the engineering program mm -hmm. because he felt like engineers were just, they were too A plus B is C and, and, and they didn't, couldn't quote Shakespeare and, and never read a book and, you know, they get very analytical and they lose that cerebral quality that mm -hmm. the humanities actually brings to you. Uh, so you didn't go to St. John's to get a job. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, got a job, I got a job offered from St. Mary's College in Moraga, California, outside of San Francisco. Great and, basketball uh, program, by the way. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. They, 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 they had, they've had a good basketball program for a long time, but, uh, if they've been the chief they play, they play in, a in the world. Box. It's really small, really small place. So you have, there's a definite home court advantage. <laughs> it's they, fantastic. They had a little, they had a program, partly a, a, a small program within the larger college uh, that was um, modeled on the St. John's program. And oh, so wow. needed someone to teach. And I said, yes. And so that moved wow. from... Santa Fe. For, so I'd gone from East Texas to Santa Fe, New Mexico to Moraga, California. So the climate was getting increasingly better at every step. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Although I love, New Mexico, I really fell in love with New Mexico. Santa yeah. Fe is a beautiful spot in New Mexico itself is. I mean, I'm a Colorado boy, so I grew up in Denver and uh, we went to we went to northern New Mexico all the time. And my my grandmother or my yeah my grandmother's sister my great aunt emigrated to santa fe as an electrolysist to celebrities and she ended up doing some some great art collecting and different things from the tau school back in the oh, yeah. 40s and so we had a lot of really interesting artwork in our house from that northern new mexico that's nice action yeah so you went to moraga and uh, at st mary's what did you teach i taught Within that program, I, I taught a variety of things. I taught Newton, mainly Newton, and it was the, the, the uh, science uh, piece of it in the third year. And I taught uh, I taught mathematics in various years. I don't. Know, I, I taught. I was there for seven years, or I think. Wow. So I taught pretty much everything. So somehow, somewhere along the line, I remember that uh, you were at Bechtel when you first met. Uh... Greg Howell. So how did you get from Santa F St. John's to St. Mary's to? Well, I got laid off. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, had, I, I was so, having so much fun. I had foolishly uh, not taken the precaution of uh, studying in advance, getting an advanced degree. And so when they had a crunch uh, in, in enrollment, they, uh, they laid me off. And it's probably wow. the best thing that ever happened to me. I, uh, I I went I went with my new wife, new wife, 
um, I went to back to Houston and I got a job at a summer job as a uh, pipe fitters helper uh, and uh, with Brown and Root, not with Bechtel. OK, not oh, yet. OK, not yet. Brown Root. Right. And uh, I, I loved it from the moment I got there. I mean, I just I loved working outside. I loved working with my hands. I love being able to see the almost immediately the product of your labors. And I really enjoyed the people that I worked with. So, wow! But yes. uh, they, they didn't let me do that very very long. I uh, I, I was put into construction engineering, and uh, and uh, that's where I met Greg. And it was on a project with um, it was an Olefins unit, petrochemicals unit, uh, with a joint venture of Conoco and Monsanto, and they fought like dogs and cats. <laughs> the owners. And uh, it caused all kind of trouble, and we probably didn't uh, help. And uh, so there was a, there had been two changes of the Brown and Root project manager. And the third change brought in this guy named Howard Peak, And he had never been a project manager. He was the uh, outside boundary limits OSBL uh, project superintendent at the time. And but he and I became really good friends, and I got picked uh, in a crazy thing that Greg Howell could only tell appropriately uh, to be the coordinator for a group of consultants that Howard brought back from a University of Texas Construction Productivity Improvement Conference. And this was like 1979, and we were about six months away from scheduled completion. We we're way over budget and way over. <laughs> Way over, way running it way under time, right? And uh, and so we did a productivity. We did a work improvement program, and uh, yeah, and it worked. And we wound up the, that that project uh, accomplishment wound up on the cover of Engineering News Record. Wow, was that the only time you were on the cover of Engineering News Record? I think so. Uh, it's, it's too bad. <laughs> I know Will was That's on where I met time. Greg. I met Greg and Mike Caston was also on that project. I think your viewers know him. He was yes. A, yeah. And uh we later worked on a project together in Venezuela, which Mike may have mentioned, I'm not sure. But it was uh it was called Park Proyecto Arquacion Refinaria Cardon. <laughs> and right. it was in the only stinking desert in Venezuela. Uh, wow. Uh, was, who who would have guessed there's a desert in Venezuela, right? Well, it's a, it's kind of a peninsula, and it's uh, sticking out into the ocean, and something prevents things from growing in the sand. Okay. <laughs> so, well, we were on that project. We uh, they had to improve productivity because they had ten thousand workers on the site. They were in a similar situation to the one that I just described. It was in a year from schedule completion, way over budget and way running out of time. And there were no, uh, not, the, um, the accountants, the project accountants uh, calculated that in order to bring it in on time, they needed 8,000 additional workers. And there were not 8,000 additional workers available who could both walk and chew gum at the same time. So I was, this was a project, wasn't it, where you guys walked around and you said, there's all these kinds of people wandering around the project and, and they don't even have like a two by four in their hands. And the next day, everybody's walking around the project with a two by four in their hands, which <laughs> doubled down on the lack of productivity. I think that That's, was the Greg story. Uh, yeah. The, now all the two by fours are missing, right? So. Um, so th this is really interesting because you, you obviously were intrigued by these problems but you didn't have some advanced engineering degree someplace that would say, well, here's how you apply, you know, these principles to productivity. So you kind of had to think of it almost draw right out of the box. In that sense, you kind of had to invent what was the problem and what's the solution. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I, at that, around that time and for that same uh, productivity improvement conference, I, that a later, a later year, I, uh, presented a paper called crew level planning. And if you wanna see the early seedbed for the last planner system, read that paper. Wow. So you were published on the, in the lean construction journal. 
So when did you start writing papers and, and deciding that I'm going to tackle these problems and then I'm going to write about it? When did you, was that part of kind of being an academic a, or? I didn't have the academic background, so I didn't really think about, I don't think I really learned how to write uh, academic papers until I got my PhD. <laughs> and that was a good reason to get it. Uh, yeah. And that puts you through the, puts you through the hoops. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but it, it's it's obviously that I mean it, it it seems obvious to me and hopefully it's obvious to people that are that are watching this and know you and know about your career and that you just begin to look at things and went you know that's odd why do they do that why wouldn't we try this thing and then well, good company I had met Greg Greg Howell and Mike Caston both are you know guys that think out of the box and uh, outside the box and so that was good company you know to start from. And, uh, but I did, and I, I, I kept getting thrown into situations where I could, I was free to, and it was important to solve problems. Right. And so, um, what was your kind of, a, was there a problem solving methodology? I mean, there's a, people talk about that, you know, all the time and talk about, well, you need to do this process. You need to do that process. And, uh, or was it just kind of, you know, it starts with the five whys and you just go from there? Yeah, it wasn't very structured, I don't think. I mean, but I did, I have uh, taken away and used forever um, some things I learned in that first project that it was a, that um, Olefins unit, Chocolate Bayou project is what it was called. And one was to, and, and I've used it every place I've been, is go talk to the work, people doing the work, right? And so, I mean, I I, I can tell you later. I, I moved back to um, the San Francisco area and joined Bechtel in 1982, I think. Yeah, but in that intervening two years between the Chocolate Bayou project and going to Bechtel, I was the manager of productivity improvement for one of Brown and Root's construction divisions, and in my First complete year, we improved productivity by ten percent, and this was in uh, this was uh, the the division was responsible for. They had changed the. Uh, they, they found out that their different uh, construction divisions were competing with one another, and that didn't seem reasonable. <laughs> and so, uh, the, my the one I was with, uh, even though we had been doing oil and gas, we started doing just uh, forest products. So pulp and paper. Oh, and so okay. I, had, I was responsible. I had staff on on every pulp and paper paper project in design and construction for Brown and Root in the United States. So, so I mean, it's it's really amazing that you. So you're laid off from your job. You get in your car. You go to Houston with your new wife. You are doing an internship with Brown and Root, and within a year or two, you're the head of productivity for. <laughs> A segment of the company that's that's a that's a pretty meteoric rise yeah yeah i i i like i say i think i was uh, blessed with people who were uh, they weren't embarrassed that i didn't have much experience as long as i was producing getting <laughs> delivering the goods <laughs> right so so when you tackle the productivity problem i mean when i think of productivity uh because i've been in an awful lot of trailers where um or site superintendents think of productivity as making people do work faster rather than doing work better. But I think the two components of it is is trying to get to that kind of perfect, you know, tact about how long it takes to do something to make sure that you're you're focused on getting that done. But it's also taking the space out between the other work or the other things that you do so you can concentrate on your work. And so when when you were when you were thinking about this stuff afresh. Um, how did you how did you focus on, you know, where the issues were, where the problems were? Because Greg had just come from this, you know, wonderful stint with Henry Parker and doing his uh, slow motion, slow mo, you know, work framing and saying, oh, it's the framer. And I'd go down and help the framer. And then that backlog would just get pushed forward. And he goes, I'm not helping the project very much. I made the framer really productive, but that didn't help the overall project. So how did right. you how did you tackle it? What, what were you looking for? And. And what did you see? Well, ultimately, I was looking for flow, as you're suggesting, right? 
And uh, uh, so I would start by looking for in interruptions to flow, right? And I think I, well, I didn't understand right away, but I came to understand that you really needed to have a structure like the last planner system in order to facilitate flow, right? And because otherwise it's just push, 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 right? Right. So, so one of the things I, that, that I did with Greg uh, on the Chocolate Bayou project was uh, um, craftsman questionnaires, delay questionnaires. So we would just ask people, well, what's keeping you from doing your work? How much time do you lose? Right? And uh, we have time for a story. Well, of course. We've we've got, we got all day, my all friend. Out, right? Not to worry. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then this is this is this is with Greg. So uh, so one of the things that was when we did the first survey. One of the things, one of the many things that uh, craft workers told us was that they, half the time they went to the tool room, we had five tool rooms, 2000 people on site. And so they were scattered around, you know, the, 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 uh, the footprint of the plant. And uh, they said that half the time they went to get something, a tool or, a, or some type of um, <laughs> hell, a rag or a pencil, right? Whatever. Uh, they didn't get it. And so, we went into Howard Peak. Remember, he's the new project manager, and uh, we said Howard da 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 da, and Howard elevated, and he was a tall guy. He got taller, and he said that bullshit can't possibly be true. I've spent three million dollars on small tools, and now you can't tell me that's the truth. And we said, well, uh, uh, don't shoot the messenger. Could we go talk to Billy, who's head of the, the superintendent over the warehouse, and he's responsible for the tool rooms. He says, and not only do, do I allow it, I insist that you get there, and I'm calling right now and tell him to stand up. You're on your way. And as we're walking out the door, Greg turns back and says, well, Howard, you know, there must be some, some turndowns. What, what percentage out of 100 do you think it might be? And Howard says, uh, I, I can't believe it's more than one or three, one or two, something like that. Just it's all very small. OK, check. Right. And we go talk to whatever his name was. And uh, it's, we, the same thing plays out. Absolutely the same thing. And as we're going out, we say, well, what do you think? Da, da, da. And he said, I don't remember the exact numbers. It's written down somewhere. But but it was maybe 10 percent. OK. Right. And we said, well, can we talk to Wally, the general foreman over the tool rooms? Yeah. And go do it. Da, 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 da. He's, Wally said, I think he's at 20 percent. OK. And then we go to a, he said to Wally, can we go to a, talk to a tool room attendant? <laughs> right. We're trying to get closer to the problem. Right. Right. Uh, and we do. And we asked, well, what do you think the turndown rate is? He says, well, I, ha I haven't actually tracked it, but I think it, it might be, you know, maybe 25 or 30 percent because right now because we're having a real shortage in grinder discs, right? Okay, so we say, do you mind if one of us sits here and counts? <laughs> and he says, no, no, go ahead, get after it, right? Well, his boss told him to, to, to treat us well, right? Right. Greg Greg drew that straw and he he counted and the craft people weren't right. It wasn't fifty percent; it was forty seven. Wow! Now it turned out that that was uh, a little bit skewed because it was after, it was during the day as opposed to at the beginning of the day, right? But there was it did reveal that there was a lot of hoarding going on, and hoarding is driven by an experience of not having something when you need it. Right? right. And so the, the gang boxes tend to get filled up with everything you might need, even though you don't need it now. And that means you can't have enough. <laughs> right. And, and this and, and system unreliability sparks that. Exactly. It's, you, you just don't trust it. So you start. It's been it, it's funny because that's how my wall of wine got developed during covid. Because I just wasn't sure <laughs> that I would get another delivery. So I I stacked it up and before I knew it, I had, you know, 85 bottles of wine or something just to make sure, mm. you know, that in this period. Well, hopefully, of time, hopefully they were long aging. 
Yes, they were. They some of them are still there, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. So, so you took that that work, and um, I mean, as you get closer to the work, you find out more and more of the truth, right? This is the essential well, that's, part. That's of... the point we took away from that one. Is it, and it was literally true in that case, and I and it seems from my subsequent experience to be generally true that the further away you are from the direct work, the less you know about what's going on there. It, and that, that, you... that's not a necessary truth. Right. But it tends to be very common. Yeah. Well, it, it seems to be exactly what I see in my experience as well. Um, and it's it's funny because the guy who's running things, Howard, Howard thought he was completely on top of it because he had people reporting to him um, and he was he was overseeing what needed to be done. And he was able to report that, you know, everything's fine when the ship is is sinking. Uh, <laughs> gurgle, gurgle. <laughs> so now I'm beginning to see the uh, the 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 start of a a last planner kind of you know we need to go ask the guys who are doing the work you know what work they think they're doing. Well, I wanted that to be the um, the last um, the last defense, right? Right. So it seemed to me that if you if you really wanted to so we wanted to build it backwards if you will if we can know that uh, we're not assigning work to be done and it's not being done just because it's in the schedule right or somebody's crazy idea then we can work backwards to make sure that what we do want to have done we have everything we need to do it right yeah, I mean, I, if there was ever a system that was set up to be completely divorced from reality, it's the way that we schedule <laughs> construction projects, right? I know. I know. I know. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. And it's, uh, yeah. I remember even at that time on that chocolate bio project, I keep going back to it because kind of uh, formative of my, my thinking. Uh, I was, as I was an area engineer, right? One of three. And uh, we would get these boxes of computer printouts and there was no instruction about what to do with them. And so they just piled up. Right. right. And then I said, I, was, I decided I was going to look at one one day and I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. <laughs> and as far as I could tell, it had absolutely no connection with what we were doing in the field. So, that somebody was being paid, paid to do it. And yeah. that, you know, and that kind of reminds me. Crystal showed up in in Iraq, and he found out that all its really interesting information were stuck in pouches in a closet because nobody knew where to send it, whether it was the NSA or the CIA. So they just you know just threw it in the closet. It's kind of yeah. the reverse of that, right? That the the the, be, the deep into that schedule printout someplace might have been a kernel of knowledge that somebody could have pulled out, but who knows. Yeah. Um, well, the problem the problem with the approach to scheduling is is it really is driven by the idea of optimization, right? And that so so the the claim is that the presupposition at any rate is that you can determine months, maybe years in advance to the day exactly what's going to happen, right? Yeah. And without without in basically no other reliance than on command, right? Wait, it, 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 the, what, and, and the real presupposition to that is that, work. <laughs> is that everything will be ready to go in perfectly on time, right? That everything will right. be will be at your at your disposal when you need it, and people will work as you have programmed the work, even though that program of work that's stuck in the schedule is full of unseen buffer anyway. Well, and unseen assumptions, right? Not right. unstated assumptions, and you couldn't. It'd be a. You'd have to have a book with your schedule in order to understand all the assumptions that are implicit in it. But I. But I'm my my thinking as my experience has led me to really think that, you know, looking back to what your original plan was, is almost useless, right? Right. What you want to be doing is looking forward to where you're going to go from where you are. Right. Yes, exactly. Let's plan to complete, not plan to repair. Uh, and, and plan to release as well, right? I mean, just keep things moving. Um, it's. I think it was Mike Tyson that said everybody has a plan until you get hit in the face. 
Yeah. And that is like hour one on a construction process. Exactly. I mean, it doesn't take long for your for your schedule to get out of whack. And it's funny because uh, I was on a project with uh, Mark Conjure down in uh, Florida on a Balfour project for a big um, entertainment center in Orlando. Mm -hmm. and, and they had a guy who had been a project management kind of pinbog guy. Um, who was the now he was the head of buildings for the city of Orlando. And I think he'd been with URS or somebody. And he used to come over to the project with the schedule and he would do a red line on this day. And he said, well, let's walk the schedule and see if any of this work's being done. And of course, invariably, either the work was done or it wasn't done. And it had nothing to do with the schedule. All things that were happening on the job were completely unrelated to his red line. And it got him so frustrated. He said, how could, how could this be the world that we operate in? And it sounds like your story about Howard elevating himself, you know, going, oh my God, how could that possibly be true? Right. And, and it, the, the reality is that we have divorced ourselves from how the work actually gets done. Right. And so it's not, I mean, to write, to accept the fact that you, that our ability to predict the future is uh, limited. <laughs> <laughs> right. It doesn't mean we can't do anything. Right. Right. I think there's a lot that can be done, but you have to be more nimble and take advantage of you have to you have to wake up all your sensors and the people in different positions in the job are your sensors. Right. right. And and but uh, but but if you think that it's going to work just because you've given an order, made a statement of demand, which is what the schedule is. Right then you're just crazy. <laughs> it never, in fact, never happens. So you're working with Brown and Ruth and you, uh, then you moved to Bechtel and you're, you're now in a kind of engineering classification um, without actually being an engineer, right? At the time you weren't, right. what they would, what they would, uh, in, in, in Canada, it's easy to tell engineers because they get a little ring that they put on their pinky finger. Um, that reminds them of a failed bridge structure. So they're always thinking about oh, yeah. you know, it's supposed, to, it's supposed to be a piece of that uh, failed bridge. So it's quite a, yeah. <laughs> it's quite a uh, it's quite a fraternity or sorority, depending on on you know where you where you graduate. So how did you did you did you start to migrate into a uh, an engineering degree? Did you uh, at some point, I think, don't you have to get a master's before you can get a PhD or it's all part of the process? I had a master's. I had a, uh, an MBA in production, oh, okay. operations, operations management. Yeah. Nice. And where'd you get that? Uh, uh, it was funded by Bechtel and it, uh, I chose the, uh, a place called Holy Names College. This is right down. I could almost hit it with a rock. that had a really good arm <laughs> from my home. <laughs> And, so, uh, so you and the Pope uh, happen to you, you and the Jesuits happen to be very well connected between St. John's and St. Mary's and holy names. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. It's that it's that Jesuit liturgy of uh, of education and strong, you know, moving moving people forward. At least that was the good part of the Jesuits, right? That's the yeah. sensible part. Mm -hmm. Um okay, so you're now at Bechtel, and uh, I'm assuming you're keeping your uh, your relationships up with Greg and with Mike Caston and Howard and some of these people that you met. Well, Greg, because Greg was on the West Coast, and I think he had something to do with me coming to Bechtel, you know, being offered that job. <laughs> I think they asked him to do it, and he said, turned it down, but he said, but Ballard might. <laughs> <laughs> so. so he ended up at Bechtel, which was one of the, uh, one of the great... Um, opaque companies of the world that had started as the 29 companies on the Hoover Dam, right? Hmm. It hadn't been that creation, I think, of a, an amalgamation of people who said, hey, we worked pretty well on the Hoover Dam. Why don't we go do, why don't we go do other big projects in the world? Yeah. And so what was uh, your that, was a, that, was a, that was a good five years or something like that that I was with them. I, uh, I started on uh, Chevron's Richmond Lube Oil project in uh, Richmond, California, which is just on the, on the bay. Yeah. across from San Francisco. And we brought in that project at 15% below budget. And then subsequently, I just moved into the uh, home office to work with the projects as a whole, design and construction. And I began to learn a lot. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. 
Yeah, and one of, just to say, just would say something about this uh, this fifteen percent thing. So there was a, a series of three projects at Arco Cherry Point up in Washington State, and the people that I had worked with uh, the, in Richmond were doing those those projects, and so they were using the same methods that we had developed and applied, and they they had a similar experience. In three successive projects, they they reset the, the budget for the performance of the last one, and they improved it by 15%. They reset the budget to the performance of the last one. They improved it by 15%. So they were down somewhere around 60% of original cost. Right? Wow. Yeah, uh, I've, I've, I've taken that, you know, I have this, this kind of fundamental belief that it, it takes a certain amount of money to build a project at a certain amount of time and everything else is just you know waste in the system that doesn't get you there but it's remarkable how how we think about these things as under budget when budgets are often comprised of contractual negotiations and not some really deep understanding of what the project is so when you start when you start having that kind of impact on projects um, what kind of conclusions does that lead you to? What does it does it does it create for you a, a kind of paradigm for? Wow, now this is how we have to attack projects. Well, uh, I I didn't know any. I hadn't heard the heard the term lean until I think I read the uh, uh, the machine that changed the world, right? And. Uh, but I think that what I was seeing was the truth that that waste is not something, right? It's not like the excess inventory. It's not like underused capacity. It is the potential, the potential for improvement, right? Right. And the potential for improvement can take us a very long way. So we don't know. There's no natural cost to anything, right? It so because the mind and all the way from product design to process design and execution can improve. So just you can see lose. Things the yeah. challenge is how do you how do you organize so as to encourage people to learn constantly and forever? It was funny. I was talking to the guys from Haley and Aldridge today, and they've come up with this kind of. Uh, tool for analyzing a contractor's readiness or whatever. And they have 70 different things that owners would like to see in people. And one of them is a learning organization. And I said, you know, I, I think I would take a learning organization over the other 69. <laughs> but no matter how bad you are, if yeah. you're improving, I'd rather have you on my team. <laughs> exactly. Right? Exactly. Until you have those limits. So at some point in time, uh, you met Todd Zabel and you met Iris and and you uh, and you met um, uh, your international partners, Laurie Koskala and others. And you began oh. thinking about something that you called lean. You began to dub it as lean. Tell us a little bit about how that all came together. Well, well, maybe I'll start with Todd. Uh, I met him when I gave my, the first talk I gave on the last planner system was in Santiago, Chile <laughs> in 1992. No, 1992. And then the second one was in uh, somewhere in the Bay Area in 1994. And Todd Zabel was in that audience. And when I, I asked the question of the audience, that I'm trying to, to collect data on what you, what's being done to improve planning. And I'd appreciate it if, uh, you know, I'll come talk to you, just raise your hand, give me a card. And the only person that spoke up was Todd Spell. Wow. And so I, and I, and I went to work with them and I worked with them at the Pacific Contracting. It was a, a buildings envelope company and, uh, you know, not glamorous, but real work. And uh, and had a great time. So at one point we, uh, I, this was, uh, I think we had worked together for a year, and he and I were looking at the numbers and the books and the profits and all that, and saying, well, what you know, what can we do to really go better, do better, you know? We right. were doing pretty well, but we we had the, both had the feeling that we were just, you know, at the tip of the iceberg, and uh, so 
we came up and I don't know who's I, who I noted it kind of simultaneous maybe, but we said we were, we were working, our, our workers were union, belonged to a union. And I said, one of us said, or both of us said, you know, we, we can't pay them less than the union scale, but there's nothing that says we can't pay them more. Right. And so, so we cut the, uh, we doubled their pay. We cut it first. First, we cut the workforce in half and then double it. The ones, the ones that remain, we doubled their pay and we quadrupled productivity no. and profit. Right. As a nice little, <laughs> nice little, yeah, a little, a little, right. little icing on the cake. Um, okay, so that's how I met Todd. And then uh, Iris, I didn't meet until I think she came to Cal in 1996 or seven. And from Michigan, she had taught at Michigan University of Michigan previously. And uh, that's when we met. And you so, had put together or you and, and your international friends had put together the IGLC prior to that, right? I think that was 91 or 92. Yeah, I met I met um, Lowry, uh, a, a colleague of mine at Cal had invited him. I don't know how he knew about it, but invited him to come over from Stanford, where he was doing a one-year uh, SIFI study uh, that turned out to be a new on the new production philosophy, which we later was later we adopted the term lean, and uh, and he came and he talked and we I talked to him after and we started talking and. In 1993, that was 1991, I think. In 1993, we put together the uh, the first international group for lean construction meeting. Wow! And how did you how did you find like Sven Bertelson and some of these other folks all around the world? Those that were thinking um, about the same stuff you guys were thinking about. Yeah, just by uh, I'm not sure exactly how to say it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was I signed Denmark to the first lean construction institute outside of the United States. Mm. And so and then uh, Sven was obviously a big mover and shaker in that community. So that's how we met. So when you started the Lean Construction Institute, you and Greg and I think Todd was part of that initially. And, and, and Iris, and as, Iris well. as well. Um, did that happen over a beer at uh, Alice Waters Place in uh no, it, takes, uh, it actually comes it comes back to the um the Venezuela project in the stinking desert. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> now this Greg and I never agreed about this. I think I thought about it. I thought up the idea and he'd say it said I he thought up the idea, but but it doesn't really matter. Coming back from the we 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 succeeded at that project and we delivered the project on schedule. With the exception of two systems, project systems that uh, the delay of which didn't have any financial impact on the on the client. So, and then and we also in, uh, improved productivity by twenty eight percent in that last year. And we did wow. it with we they had signed us. They had a really weird uh, you know, union, a political union that. If you brought somebody onto the project, you couldn't lay them off and then hire some other people of the same trade later right so, wow <laughs> so, so that's why they were they were up to ten thousand people right. <laughs> half, of them, half of them didn't have anything to do but uh <laughs> so. and, and, and which well it was funny that the solution to finishing the project on time that the accountants came up with was you already have ten thousand people five thousand of which aren't doing anything add another eight thousand people <laughs> then nothing will be done at all yeah, <laughs> so, that will guarantee that nothing will be done, and it'll cost you a lot more money. Uh, that's interesting. So, so you came up with the idea of the Lean Construction Institute, and um, yeah. So on the way back, once we had um, kind of had the celebration in Venezuela with the client and everything, uh, we were on the way back and uh, lubricated by a few alcoholic beverages. We started thinking about, well, what the hell are we? What's going on here now? We were on the edge of having repeat customers for saving bad projects. And is that how we want to live our life? Right? Is that what we want to do? So right. it's, what we said was, it's obvious, and that this was a string. I wrote them out, and I have a list. There's a string of maybe six or seven projects, of which this was one, that uh, basically had the same look, 
taste and feel, right? They were failed projects, failing fast, and it looked like they were basket cases, but we brought them out, right? And so <clears throat> what we realized was that we had, we had, we, we knew we could do it, but right. we didn't know enough to make our clients able to do it without us. And so that's why we formed LCI. We said, we've got to figure this out. So we thought of LCI not as a recruiting program, but as a research project. Right. right. So. As a as a think tank in some ways. And exactly. That's exactly how we thought of it. Right. And, and, and producing good work. So what LCI is today is not exactly what you imagined it would be, I take it. Well, I'm I'm not disappointed. I think they can do they do good work, but um, I do think that. Well, I've I've just recently given uh, the same talk at the IGLC conference in France in June, and then at uh, the LCI uh, conference at USA con 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 Congress in Detroit this this last a you know, couple of weeks ago. And that was on the future of the of lean construction. And I'm challenging the industry to recognize, first of all, that the objective is the global construction industry, the lean transformation of the global construction industry. And that's what I've been working on for the last 30 years. And I think we need to get at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I think you, you, you must feel pretty good looking back and knowing that you've you've had a, a part in actually changing the way that we think about building buildings and facilities in the world and you're actually changing the kind of construct of the built environment, which is pretty powerful. If you think about it from a, you know, a guy that was breaking horses in Southeast Texas to a guy who was reading a hundred great books and um, what a, what a great career path uh, at some point, but I don't want to jump too far ahead in the story because I, I do think that, I know that the work that you were doing um, at Heathrow was again kind of a cast of characters that you were <laughs> surrounded with, and another great opportunity yeah. with a great owner or a great a great program to say, "Wow, what can we do to do things better?" Yeah. Here? What can you really do if you uh, if you don't don't have obstacles, right? Right. Uh, now, I was I actually worked for uh, with Todd. Uh, in strategic project solutions as the technical director on that project. And oh, then wow. subsequently okay. on the, uh, at St. Pancras station in London on the um, channel tunnel rail link project, because they were changing the terminus um, station from Waterloo to St. Pancras. And so it had to be entirely revamped and it's a historic building. So it's a lovely building. It's a lovely building. Yes, it yeah. is. That's really it's it's got one of the great bars in the Western world. <laughs> I can tell you that much. I love that place. Um, so then you then you uh, went. To, so what was your segue or your your transition to, to into Berkeley, um, both teaching oh, as a oh, yeah. P two S L. Well, I I started uh, as a lecturer and uh, in nineteen eighty nine at the wow. recommendation of, of some uh, professors, civil engineering professors from Stanford that I had known through Greg, we'd been working together with them. Um, uh, and they were a member, they were members of a, um, a peer review uh, of that, that programs do, right? right. And they, they said that it seems like you're, you're not very strong in productivity and quality management. And, and uh, we know the guy that can do that. So, so yeah. I've got that job. <laughs> and were you, uh, I mean, being a professor also allows you to do other things. So were you also working with Todd and, and teaching and doing all, all these of this? Was, all of this was going on simultaneously. Yeah. yeah. So I was working with Todd. I was doing independent consulting. I was doing uh, teaching, but I think, yeah, two days a week. So I couldn't travel very far very long. So. Right. So it was a it was a constraint, as our our friend Coldrat would say. <laughs> um, so, but from there, you've you developed P two S L, which was a really a, a a wonderful transition to bring industry into 
some of these academic things that you were thinking about. I mean, they were always looking for a crossover between who are the people that could actually do, if I think it up, who are the people that can go build that water organ or whatever it is? Right. Yeah. That, and that was with Iris. So Iris and I were the co-founders of P2SL. So I've had different partners in these different uh, different uh, foundings, if you will. Yeah, yeah so all these one, different ventures. One of the, I don't know how well it's known, but one of the things that I'm most proud of about P2SL in the early days was that, you know, at this, at, at around that time, this was, we, it was formed in 2005. Right. And around that time, this was when the, um, the hospitals in California were really under the gun to meet the new, a new state law about uh, earthquake uh, readiness or earthquake. Or the uh, OSHA transition. Right. Yeah. The yeah. Office of Hospital Safety and whatever that was. Yeah. Oshpad. 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 Yeah. Right. I can never remember what it stands for. But... Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, anyway, one of the things anyway, I did was um, that. The state of California is one of few, uh, maybe the only one, but maybe another one, who uh, do not rely on um, certified engineers and architects in order to assure the designs of uh, acute care hospitals. They have their own um, department that does that, and so, <clears throat> and so there was, and there was a. As things started boiling up, right, it was pretty clear that uh, OSHA just didn't have the, the staff to keep up. And so it was really difficult to get your um, permits, right, uh, and your drawings reviewed and accepted in time to meet project schedules, right? And so people started, as you might expect, they started submitting earlier than they were before they were complete <laughs> right and that made it worse yeah <laughs> and, it, uh, and when we we got i don't remember exactly how we got involved in the problem but um but i do remember hearing the statistic that uh in those days it took um i think it took it added 18 months to the schedule of an acute care hospital for that that pro that broken process if you will right and so what we did was we we um we managed to get four of the major hospitals hospital companies healthcare companies in the state to come uh, together with oshpod and we fortunately had a, a new new appointee as the head of that uh, that um, that department that agency and he was much he was very open and willing to change and do whatever was necessary and so we, we really got past that you know casting stones uh, blaming one another and i uh, remember we met in an old uh in an empty building that had multiple rooms so we were we, were, we had a big enough room to do everything in plenary session and maybe it was a hundred people there so there were owners and there was architects and there were engineers and there were contractors and subcontractors and right. So rep, that we had a good representation. And uh, what I had them do, uh, and I was kind of the the facilit I was a facilitator, and I had them I, I handpicked four, one for each of those companies, four sub lieutenants, let's just say. To right. lead the work mapping process in each of four separate rooms, right outside of this one, I think. Well, maybe we used that one, the, the plenary session, as one of those rooms. And then periodically, I would blow a whistle, and we would do a walkthrough, right. And I still remember somebody from one of the comp one of the healthcare companies said, "You do what?" <laughs> 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 and so they started learning from each other right there, right. And just right. questioning, you know, it made them question things that they'd been uh, assumptions that they'd been making about how things had to be done. And it turned out that, um, and we started a series of meetings afterwards where people would come in and share what they were doing and what they were learning and applying those different processes that came out of those project delivery processes. And uh, 
I remember at one point, uh, Stanford came, the Stanford Medical Center people came to join just to attend one of those meetings. And they started, it sounded like you were going back a year and a half or something. And they were saying, well, if Ashpa would only do, and Ashpa didn't have to defend themselves. The other healthcare companies defended them. They said, okay, you are out of touch. <laughs> what if we can't be out of touch we're stanford for god's sake <laughs> oh, sorry yeah <laughs> time to wake up take the night at, at one point uh in that whole process the uh i asked i took a i took a straw poll from the of those four companies and they said our experience in acute care hospital projects is that we're we are we've taken a year out of that 18 months wow so I think that so, I think that's a contribution. So that's fantastic, uh, especially given that you know that that um, some people in the world may not know that Oshpod was spawned by the Northridge earthquake that right. killed a number of people, and hospitals were shaken and they were out of service, and and the the promise or the or the goal was to keep a hospital operating independently for two weeks or a month or something after a, you know a, right. a significant seismic event so you had water storage you had backup power you you took um every air a handler. different level of seismic engineering as well yeah. Yeah. and every every air handler that was going to be installed in that hospital had to get on the shaker table mm -hmm. and they shook it for <laughs> 10 minutes at richter seven or something i mean it was it was really it it, it was a very bold program well, it's got bogged down into some of the stuff that bureaucracy, you know, bureaucratic programs get stuck into, like the uh, the high speed rail between LA and San Francisco. I mean, these things are mega well, projects that turn turn sour because they get kind of bureaucratized, but they're really good ideas. Yeah. So at P2SL, you also you started partnerships with um, other people in the industry, like construction companies. I remember DPR would send folks to p2sl and they'd send interns and people to be on on the teams to study and and learn how to do things i think it was dpr i don't remember who the well there's there were a number of such companies that didn't and there still are so I, yeah yeah no, it, and we also i mean i did a i did i lasted years actually maybe three or four years I did a study with DPR on their uh, IPD projects, mm. and uh, that was very interesting because they had done the first, they had done the first acute care hospital for Sutter Health. Uh, okay, right, and so then they had done some more. So, so and and then there was also uh, other people like UHS Universal Universal Health Services. You might not quite. Bill right. Seed and his team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were doing also involved, right? Yeah, but, trying to do interesting things. Yep. Um, but Todd Bell tells the story about uh, you being at um, Heathrow, uh, and I think it was formers who were who were casting. Uh, maybe it was cast in place concrete guys or something. But there was a group of people that were doing some work, and that uh, you walked by and you kind of looked at it, and it wasn't necessarily your assignment, but you looked at it and you went. I'm curious as to why you do this. And and within two weeks, you had like quadruple productivity by oh. just one little step at a time. I think that was actually, that might have been a different thing. But what it reminds me of is work we did prior to T5, working okay. with Lang O'Rourke. They had a wholly owned subsidiary called Malling's Concrete Products. Right. And in, uh, in down in the place called Gray's. And boy, was it gray. <laughs> down further uh further east on the on uh, the Thames and mm -hmm. what what we were doing was really uh getting them ready for T5 and for a different level of competition if you will right sure and so my job I was brought in by Todd to uh to do it <laughs> and what we came up with was this idea of um so so when we got there, when we started, it, the project was organized around trades, right? So you had a superintendent over concrete, over over batching, over um, uh, rebar, over welding, over 
dot, 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 placing and so forth. And so I don't know who came up with the idea, but um, I think it was me. But um, but um, so I came up, I, I said, well, why don't we use this idea of production cells? So where the cells are organized not ar around a family of products close enough in their composition and design that you could treat them in the same process, right? Maybe with some adjustments occasionally. Right? You'd have all the same skilled workers could work on exactly. the, right. all these different things. Yep. So we didn't change anything about the crewing. We uh, didn't change anything about the technology. And the, the only thing that, the only money that was spent on change was I, I asked that they construct a shield to protect the workers from an acid bath. And that was about thirty thousand dollars or something, but but that was it. But um, so we first, when we first got, to, we we, we <laughs> I uh, I got to be good friends with the uh, the uh, plant manager, and uh, and so when we before we started, I said, um, um, what was his name? Damn it, I'll call him Nick. It wasn't Nick, but I say, look, I want you to get together the the plant mafia, the workforce mafia. And I, we want to we need to talk to them because if they're not for us, this won't work, All right? And they said, well, what are, you, what are you talking about? And I said, these are the people in the project, regardless of their position, whose opinion is going to determine what people do. And so we identified six people and some of them were supervised, some not, right? Some just you know, direct workers. And uh, brought them together and said, uh, basically, I explained what we were going to do. And uh, uh, Nick said, well, um, you have a choice to do this and to help us figure out how to do it, but we have to do it. Uh, you have a voice, but you have no choice. <laughs> So you can either help us well, or you can go away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they said we're basically we're saying that the whole organization was in peril, right? right. It was just was stumbling along. Um so any I'll just cut to the chase. So and I I selected two uh product types, fam families of products to do pilot tests on pilot projects. And one was shear walls and the other was floor segments. And uh the I met I I knew I, from records I could determine well what was the average output throughput rate for those for a day uh, previously and for uh, the uh, shear walls it was one point two walls I think it was I couldn't have been that small maybe it was two point one or something but at any rate and then the other one was about uh, I think. Damn, my, my memory's going. I can't remember. I think it was like eight, eight uh, floor sections. We had, and so I I set it up so that there was um, it was based on pull and I, a segue, but I think it's a, a, appropriate. So I'm I'm walking with the plant manager through the project, and we spent a lot of time doing that. And I said, uh, Nick, damn, so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try I'm gonna try to tell you I'm gonna try to to say what you're looking at. He said, Well, he was a little Welsh fire 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 plug. And uh, he used some expressions I knew were curse words, although I didn't understand them. <laughs> and he said, Well, how can you tell me what I'm looking at? I said, Well, let me try. I said, You're looking at those hooks to see if they're loaded, and you're looking at those uh Iron iron workers fixers to see if they're bending wire, right? He says, "Well, what else would I be looking at?" I said, "Well, if you look at that stack, uh, the place where the uh, completed uh, tied um, um, what do you call them? Mm -hmm. Sure, whatever replaced. Yeah, um, I say if there's one, at least one, but not no more than three. You don't have to worry about what you're looking at. It'll take care of itself. Right. So we so we encouraged using that kind of a mechanism 
um, we triple productivity. Wow. Yep. We doubled Shut it up. in the case of the floor segments because we didn't, we only had 18 moles. <laughs> so we could only double it. <laughs> right. So, so you're really looking at at the at the either the the end of the line or the queue, and if it's empty, you're not you're not productive enough. And if it's if it's got 19 things there, you're in trouble. Yeah, because something's stuck. Right? Yeah. So that, that's really interesting. Look at the output, not the not the process necessarily, because the output will tell you there's a problem in the line. Yeah. If you know what how it's supposed to work, you can tell by looking at any place in it whether it's working. Right. That's fantastic. That, that simplifies. So so what are you doing now? What are you um, you know, you're supposed to be retired, supposedly, and I guess I'm supposed to be retired too, but not. <laughs> We're getting in the way. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um process well, of the think, world keeps getting in the way. Well, I do things like this. I give talks. I, uh, I, uh, I'm just publishing a book along with a bunch of other people. Or, oh, nice. Or, yeah. What's it called? Target Value Delivery of Building Projects. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Who's, who are your co-authors? Uh, well, my co-editor is, uh, um, well, I think I haven't had enough to eat today or something. My brain isn't functioning. Is Peter Morris. Peter oh, okay. Morris. He's a, I think you may, I don't know if you know him, but he's a good, he's a really good guy. And then I have go. people from, uh, so one part of the book is, um, is devoted to five um, kind of cases that uh, are written by people with, in, that operate in different positions in the industry. So I've got one from an owner, happens to be from Norway. Yeah. One from a, a cost consultant, it happens to be Peter. Uh, one from Bolt, one from DPR. Is Peter at UC Davis? Sorry? Is Peter at UC Davis? No, he's not an academic. He's a, a cost consultant for, he used, he, he's now with um, AECOM. Okay. He's responsible for the Americas or something. So, gotcha. <laughs> I, I, I love that idea. The Americas. <laughs> <laughs> America Vespucci would would love that idea. Mm -hmm. So so what's your passion? What do you want to what do you want to do right now? What's the thing that you're really focused on because you feel like, wow, this is this is what I love doing? Well, I'm I'm torn I'm torn. I'd really like to continue doing research and writing. But I think this uh, this I, this initiative to really focus to coordinate action of the different body, the lean construction bodies in the world, right, uh, in pursuit of the same objective, and that's global transformation. Mm -hmm. Right. And so someone's got to do it, and I, I probably have self-selected. So. You, you certainly got the. Uh, uh the lean credentials that academic credentials the industry reputation and the, the respect of people so i'm i'm sure it's not difficult to get somebody to answer a phone call <laughs> yeah um you've I been a, a lot. I, I think i feel sometimes i feel like i'm kind of trying to uh be a uh, try to impartially at least fill greg's role as a connector you know fantastic the things that he did so well and uh so it, it, yeah he was he was awesome i mean and i mean part of the reason for this podcast is because we lost one of the great storytellers out there and we're collecting that story i've been doing a lot of work up here with indigenous people and the importance of an oral tradition from elders is uh is absolutely apparent to me that and that's one of the things that i've been trying to do with the podcast is create this you know, body of rich stories. Mm -hmm. um, and yours is one of the richest, my friend. So yeah, I appreciate well, it. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I appreciate you taking the time. That's a noble effort. <laughs> well, it's it's a good effort and it's it's been great knowing you. It's funny, I told somebody today, yeah, I'm uh, Glenn Ballard's joining me on the podcast. And he goes, oh yeah, he's the, he's the guy that goes, uh, every prediction is a forecast and every forecast is wrong. And the longer the forecast, the wronger it is, right? Now I went, 
that's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't make that up, I think, <laughs> but but it's true. <laughs> but it, it has been attributed to you. So thank you so much for taking the time. Good luck with the journey out there. Let me know how I can help. Um, we're always eager. And one of the nice things about being in Canada for the last seven years, it's a it's a more manageable space to try mm -hmm. to really have an influence on 33 million people or 36 million people rather than 330 million people. Right. Oh. And, and it's a very homogeneous um, kind of industry. Everybody knows each other. And so uh, it's an opportunity. So we'll have to get you up here. Carla Sipliski, just along with uh, uh, Farooz Hama, started a thing called Lean Design Construction Canada mm -hmm. as a way of counteracting LCI Canada that was a, a CCA. Canadian Contractors Association group, um, and they're really they're really diving into a more a really trying to join the, the the academic with the practical, like you and Iris did at P2SL, and uh, make these learnings available. So we'll have to get you up here and have a stop with those folks. Well, don't don't wait until it's too cold. No, I'm going to wait till the summer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend. So good to see you. Uh, thank you thank so you. much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Well. All right, Glenn. Thank you. You too. Good luck out there with that world transformation thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have a role. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, have a role. I'm happy to help, man. Really happy to help. So thanks very much. Thank you for tuning in to the Lean Construction Blogs podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please help us spread the word by sharing, subscribing, or leaving a review on your preferred podcast listening platform. Remember to join us next time as we continue to lower the barriers to applying lean construction and help take your lean journey to the next level. And don't forget to visit the Lean Construction blog to stay up to date on our latest podcast episodes, weekly blog posts, monthly webinars, and upcoming conferences. We hope to see you on the next episode.